Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. And uh, thank you for making it to almost the last session of the conference. My name is Minakshi Kaushik. And I want to introduce my co-speaker, Shiva Krishna Marla. We both work at NVIDIA and are responsible for helping customers deploy and lifecycle manage NVIDIA inference microservice, in short known as NIMS, on Kubernetes. And uh, we see customers using variety of deployments from Helm charts to KSERV to our open source NIM operator. Today, we are going to share some of the learnings in helping our customers. And uh, the agenda for today's uh, session is as follows. We're going to start with overview and then look at components of inference and fine tuning that are different from a typical microservice and then look at some of the emerging technologies such as AI agents, and finally, conclusion. So generative AI is giving rise to sovereign clouds because customer wants data sovereignty, security, and privacy. And uh, most of the enterprise really want to customize because they want to provide uh, business-specific answers as seen from this chatbot. So let's take a look at these pipelines. So a simplistic inference pipeline is you would have a large language model front-ended with a guardrail. Uh, for a rack pipeline, you would, uh, have an, uh, you, you would have an enterprise data, and you would use an embedding model to index your data using a vector database. And then in response to the customer query, um, you would use an LLM framework such as a lang chain and use an embedding model to retrieve the relevant chunks, and then finally re-rank it, combine it with a query, and provide the response. Finally, uh, for fine-tuning models, you would run a fine-tuning job and then evaluate, and if it is good enough, use your uh, uh, LoRa adapters, generate LoRa adapters, and fine-tune and start serving. So when we take a look at these pipelines, there are inference servers such as embedding, re-ranking, and large language models. And then there are fine-tuning jobs, which is in uh, blue, and dependencies, which are really well-known services, microservices, which we know about, which is vector databases or uh, even uh, guardrails and evaluator. So we are going to focus more on inference servers and fine-tuning jobs in this presentation. So when we took, take a look at current landscape, there is awesome work which is going on in open source community. It, uh, there, are, uh, there are inference ser uh, server, server platforms as well as training platforms such as KSERV, Kubeflow, and also our open source NIM operator. And there are many inference servers. For example, there is VLLM, there is Onyx, there is NVIDIA NIM. Our talk is independent of these inference server platforms and also the inference servers and is applicable to all of them. So let's look at inference and fine tuning. So what's an inference server? Typically, large language models get very large. So for example, uh, there is a 405B uh, a llama model and it would have eight, uh, it, uh, it needs around 800 gig of storage. So these models are not bundled into the inference server image. So when we, when we are talking about inference server, we are talking about the model as well as the inference server. And also the inference server, a typical inference server, this is an example of NVIDIA NIM, but it's true for any inference server. It has three layers. One is the API layer, the second is the inference serving layer, and third is the runtime layer. The job of the inference serving layer and the runtime layer is to load the model, uh, model into the GPU memory and start the inferencing service. So um, now let's take a look at inference serving pipeline. So the first thing is uh, we would download the model into the Kubernetes cluster. The second would be to uh, allocate sufficient GPUs and start running the inference server and start serving, uh, ser uh, serving the customers. And the third would be performing day two management, such as upgrade, fine to, uh, upgrades, auto scale, um, and observability. A fine tuning pipeline looks almost similar. You download a foundation model into your Kubernetes cluster and then schedule your fine tuning jobs uh, using a, uh, some kind of a GPU scheduler. And then finally, it generates a LoRa model or a fine tuned model. So um, let's look at each of these components in more details and uh, what are some of the common best practices. So for model management, there are three things that are important. One is that you want, uh, the, you want the initial inference and the auto-scaling time to be quick. 
The second is that the model should be available across namespaces and across node. And third is the security of the model. So first, uh, to, uh, to make sure that you have the models uh, which you can service fast, in, uh, reduce initial inference time and auto-scaling, it is best to pre-cache the models into the Kubernetes clusters. What I've seen is that the customers don't like to directly pull the models from a uh, global container registry all the way into the Kubernetes cluster, but that they want to first pull the model into the local registry. The reason is they want to support air gap, they want to have uh, compliance uh, for the models before they push it into their environment. Uh, when pulling the models across the global and the uh, local registry, um, the, the one thing to look at is the protocols, because uh, different registries support different protocols. It could be S3, HTTPS, Hugging Face, NGC protocol, or it could be some OCI compliant. And so the, your model puller image, the, uh, the local registry, and the container registry has to match. Um, when pulling the model and making sure that it is available uh, across auto scale and initial inference, um, it, it, there are two options. One is to use a distributed storage, which is what most of our customers use, such as NFS, S3, or NB Mesh. Or uh, you can also, like uh, KServe, uh, have uh, uh, lo local, uh, local PVs, but then ensure that all, uh, it is replicated across all nodes in which you want to autoscale. So the second is that uh, the model should be available across, uh, ac across PVCs and across uh, and nodes. And uh, if you have a distributed storage and a local PV, it is very easy that it is available across uh, nodes and across, uh, across namespaces. The third is uh, security, model security. Model is a precious resource. Um, the gold standard would be you encrypt your model and the inference server decrypts the model, but uh, not, most of the models are not that kind of encrypted. And uh, you can uh, use uh, many uh, existing Kubernetes tool to uh, do some uh, initial low-level stuff. So for example, um, when you're serving the model, you can serve on different namespaces. So uh, that provides isolations, especially if, uh, with PV. Uh, and even if you're using within the same namespace, then you can have a different PV-PVC pair for the model. If you're using within the PVC, then uh, you can create different subparts. So for example, you can have a subpart for a yellow model and subpart for the orange model. So in that way, um, you only mount the subpart uh, into the uh, inference container. And you can also have a group ID uh, match between uh, when you create a, a file system with the PVC as well as with the inference server uh, so that it provides some uh, initial level of security. So now uh, let's take a look at scheduling. So really the goal uh, in the scheduling is that the model may support many GPUs, but you may have a preference of a GPU. So the goal of the model, is, uh, the goal of uh, the scheduling is that the, uh, you can allocate your preferred GPU into the Kubernetes, uh, uh, for your model in the Kubernetes cluster. So the, the very simplistic approach is to use a Kubernetes scheduler to, uh, to achieve this. Uh, uh, this, this works great, except if you have mixed nodes. So like for example, here uh, in this cluster, there is an L40S, A100, and H100, and Kubernetes scheduler might, uh, might pick a GPU from L40S. But uh, if you have a 70B model, then it will not fit into L40S. So uh, uh, the, the one, one thing that can be done is that you can have node selectors so, uh, so that you influence the scheduler to go to the specific preferred node and then pick up the GPU. The challenge here is that uh, if you have lots of inference servers, then you have to inject these node selectors in every pod. And uh, with the new DRA, uh, you, can uh, you can have a single resource claim template. And so you modify at a single place and then it is applicable across uh, your, all your inference server. So that's, uh, that's what you can do for a GPU scheduling. Next, let's take a look at observability and auto-scaling. So for, um, uh, uh, and, and other data operations like upgrades. So upgrades are almost similar to what exists in Kubernetes, uh, existing microservices. Uh, for example, uh, you, uh, you can do rolling upgrades or you can do canary upgrades. For observability, because the system is getting complex, it would be best to have 
three layers of uh, 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 three or four layers of observability. Or the level one observability would be like GPU. The level two observability would be observability of that platform, like for example, KServe or NIM operator. And then the third level of observability would be the inference server itself. So for example, NIM or VLLM model that you are using. And uh, once you have observability in place, uh, it is very easy to start uh, using it for auto scaling. Uh, for auto scaling, it's best to use the uh, inference uh, server uh, uh, matrix because uh, small models like embedding and the re-ranking model, you may have a single model running on uh, uh, multiple models running on a single GPU, especially if you have an H100 or an A100 GPU. So if you use the GPU matrix, it, uh, it, uh, it will not reflect really which, which of the inference server model you want to scale. So it would be good to use the uh, model server metrics. And uh, I know there has been many talks uh, on, in, this, uh, in this conference. Um, the KV cache is a very uh, good matrix to use because it's a leading edge matrix which gives uh, a state of uh, it has not saturated and uh, you want to auto scale. Um, if you configure auto scaler, you won't be able to scale to zero. So the preferred, uh, if you want to scale to zero, then uh, have a scaler like Keda. So with that, let me show you a simple um, <clears throat> demo. Let me just see. Yeah. So I'm showing the demo using NIM operator. NIM operator is a very simple operator. It has three CRDs. It has a caching CRD. It has a serving CRD and a pipeline. And so we look at start by looking at how we pre-cache the models into the Kubernetes cluster. So for uh, pre-caching the model, uh, this is almost similar across KServe, across NIM operator. You have a model puller image. So um, the, the model puller image supports, uh, some of the model puller image supports only a single protocol, like here, uh, uh, or it may support multiple protocols. For example, we plan to support NGC, S3, HTTPS. So as long as you have that. And then um, you uh, have to attach a PVC. You can pre-create or uh, you can, uh, uh, in our case, we create the PVC, optionally create the PVC. So now we run the caching job. And this uh, caching job pulls the model either from your local registry or from the global registry into the Kubernetes cluster. So you can see that here we, I'm downloading a uh, model, which is also LoRa capable, which we are going to use in uh, other parts of our demo. And now um, this uh, uh, caching is being done, and uh, the model uh, has uh, uh, now the model is in the PVC. So this is the PVC. So next, uh, after we have pre-cached the model, we want to run this model on a Kubernetes uh, cluster. So uh, there are, the node is already labeled, especially if you're running NVIDIA GPU operator with uh, the, uh, the um, product ID as well as the GPU ID. So um, uh, I, have a, uh, I just uh, have like four GPUs on a single node cluster, so I don't really need to uh, add node selectors, but uh, it would be good to like add node selectors if you have a mixed node cluster. And uh, so here, um, uh, here I'm, uh, this, uh, this is a NIM service uh, CR, and uh, I'm pulling a, a simple small model, an 8B model, and uh, attaching the cache uh, or the PVC, and because we are attaching the cache, it, uh, I don't need to specify the limits because we auto detect the GPUs, but otherwise you have to specify the limits. And now this is configuring a horizontal pod autoscaler with minimum uh, a max of two and one replica and using KV cache uh, when KV cache exceeds 50% to spin another replica. And so now we run the service. So now the service is running. And uh, after the service is running, uh, you, uh, yeah, so there is a, the, uh, you can see the service is running, and now we'll start uh, seeing the auto scaling job. So uh, here, uh, 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 the, basically, look at the Kubernetes service to pass traffic to the NIM and uh, then see if uh, the horizontal auto scaler scales uh, as the KV cache exceeds. Um, KB cache utilization exceeds about 
So, um, yeah, so uh, in, uh, this is uh, uh, the Grafana dashboard. Uh, this is the dashboard from the GPU operator, the DCGM matrix. But as I mentioned, uh, it is preferable to use the NIM matrix or the inference server matrix. So we are now going to use the GPU matrix, and uh, we are going to use the model server matrix. And here, uh, right now, the KV utilization is very low. So we're going to just simply pass traffic and uh, once the, the traffic is passed on the Kubernetes service, which is a NIM service, and once that passes, we are going to uh, just uh, add more uh, users and add more chat completion commands, and we see that the KV matrix has started increasing as we increase the load, and uh, that uh, changes the horizontal pod autoscaler. So that's uh, really my demo, and then uh, now next, uh, Shiva will take over and for the rest of the presentation. So here you can see that uh, uh, the rep now two replicas are running and the horizontal pod autoscaler has been configured. Um, thank you. Um, um, so I'm going to talk about um, multi-LoRa serving. Um, multi-LoRa serving is a quite popular um, serving technique where um, multiple uh, fine-tuned LoRa adapters can be served using a single um, serving instance. The key thing is uh, multiple adapters will share a, a common foundation model rather than uh, for different use cases and different like different um, tasks. Rather than having to deploy different foundation models, we can have a single foundation model and attach it with a different set of LoRa adapters uh, for different tasks. Um, the advantage uh, is LoRa, LoRa adapters are very easy to build. They don't take too much computational. They don't need too much computational um, power to, to generate. Um, they are uh, built using, uh, fine-tuned using very um, fractional number of parameters um, uh, of, the, of the foundation model. And the original models of the foundation, original weights of the foundation model are untouched. Uh, once we have the, the lower adapters, uh, the key advantage is efficient utilization of the GPU because we are, we are sharing the same foundation model, um, but based on the dynamic use cases that the, that the customers have, you can keep loading and unloading these lower adapters from the GPU memory. So in this case, we have uh, three different lower adapters. Um, uh, one lower adapter which is fine-tuned uh, for a customer support um, related data set, and also we have another lower adapter which is um, fine-tuned for code generation, and third uh, lower adapter, which is fine-tuned for math query uh, data, set, uh, math query data set. Um, and, and when the when all these requests come in, they specify adapter ID, which is nothing but the LoRa uh, adapter ID. And all these requests will batch batch together and concurrently processed within a GPU. Um, the advantage is um, so we get faster response, and also in parallel, um, it is computing uh, different tasks at the same time. Uh, in this case, if I issue a math query adapter, if it is not loaded in the GPU memory, um, it will be dynamically loaded into the GPU memory um, and gen generate a response for that particular request. Let's see a quick demo of using LoRa adapters with NVIDIA NIMS. In this case, um, I have uh, I have uh, uh, NVIDIA, G NVIDIA NIM operator installed, and also I have a, a, a PVC or NIM cache created with a base model. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to launch uh, a, a sample job to pull these LoRa adapters from NGC into the local PVC. Um, NGC have, uh, have some pre-built LoRa adapters which are fine-tuned for math-related queries. So I'm going to launch a standalone job to pull those things into, into a PVC. Um, so as you can see, uh, I'm, I'm using NGC CLI um, container here, which is basically pulling a predefined set of LoRa adapters from, from NGC into, into a local PVC. So the path in the PVC is called as a model store and LoRa's. That's where I'm downloading uh, these PVCs. And once the downloading is complete, um, now we can go ahead and deploy uh, a new service instance or an inferencing service instance. Uh, within the NIM service instance, um, I'll specify the same NIM cache, so the same PVC get used. 
but I also need to specify uh, the source path where these LoRa's are, um, are staged locally. Um, and also I have to specify the, uh, the refresh interval at which uh, the inferencing service can load these adapters if there is no request coming in. Um, so once I have the, the LoRa service up and running, yeah, let's create this new service. And once the, the new service is up and running, we can try to issue some, um, some queries, we can list the models, and also we can see the difference uh, with queries to the foundation model as well as um, to, the, to, to a particular load adapter. Um, in the inferencing service, we can see um, the, these adapters are cached. Um, and now I'm going to list all the models that are serviced by this uh, NIM service. Um, and we can see that uh, now the, the NIM container is not only servicing the base model, but also it is servicing uh, the math lower adapter and uh, the squared lower adapter that have attached. We take this adapter ID, and now for each of these adapter IDs, we can issue inferencing queries. Um, So let's take a sample a math query uh, where we have a, a, a basic, um, a very simple math query um, and issue to a foundation model. And once we issue to the foundation model, we can see that the response is accurate, but it is it is very verbose and also it gives additional reasoning. It indeed gets the answer right, but it, it gives additional reasoning and, and quite verbose. Now, if we issue the same query um, uh, using an, an, an lower adapter, which is fine-tuned with a math data set, uh, we can see the answer is quite precise, and also it's, it's very crisp. So I'm using, in this case, I'm using the, the model ID as the, the lower adapter that we have staged. And we can see um, this for the same query, So the answer is very precise um, and much more accurate. So yeah, this showcases that um, um, NVIDIA and NIM um, easily support this multi-LoRa serving, which is which is very useful in case of you have diverse set of customers who are asking um, for different use cases. You can support um, without without having to fine tune uh, without, without having to um, fine tune the the model. You can generate uh, LoRa adapters and and dynamically and rapidly deploy these uh, in a Kubernetes cluster. With that. So let's talk about AI pipelines. Um, so LLMs are not uh, deployed uh, uh, independently anymore. So most of the time, all these models are deployed in some sort of a pipeline. For example, if you take RAG as an example, uh, for RAG, we have to have an embedding model um, for, for ingesting and generating vectors, uh, vector embeddings for all, all user data. And also, you need to have a re-ranking model uh, for enabling semantic search. And all these, uh, these two models also have to be deployed along with the, uh, the base LLM model or a fine-tuned LLM model. In order to deploy all these things together, we need to choose tools which are very intuitive and also will help us manage not only deploying, but also lifecycle, day-to-life lifecycle management, which, in, which includes auto-scaling, upgrades. So all those things have to be very easily manageable through a single interface. And also, these, um, um, these tools are connected together using a framework, some sort of frameworks. And we also have some third-party dependencies. So we need to also have an easy way to connect all these dependencies together using, using a common interface. Um, let's look at an example of uh, deploying a sample pipeline, a uh, RAG pipeline, using, using the NIM operator. So in this case, I have a NIM operator installed. Um, and I'm going to bring up the three uh, models that I've talked about, embedding model, re-ranking model, and a uh, LAMA 8B model, LAMA 3 8B model. And I also have uh, to execute some, some, some queries. I also have a sample playground that we built uh, for executing RAG queries. 
And also we have um, a lang chain, um, lang, a lang chain instance running uh, to orchestrate uh, the query. So what, what we're doing is we're creating a NIM pipeline instance, uh, which is again another CRD that is installed by the NIM operator, uh, which will allow deployment of multiple NIM services together um, as one instance. And these services also can connect to other dependencies. We also have service dependency injected into the pipeline where we automatically configure um, with the deployments that we create. As soon as we create a NIM pipeline instance, we can see that um, the deployments and NIM services uh, for the corresponding models have been created, and all of them are in running state. And now we see um, the services for the, the corresponding deployments have been created as well. Um, it creates the HPA, ingress, anything that can be configured to a NIM service can be uh, deployed uh, here. So I'm uploading uh, a custom uh, data set um, into uh, into the rack system. So we have um, NVIDIA GB200 uh, data set um, ingested by this rack pipeline. So before using the knowledge base, we issued a sample query to the rack, uh, rack pipeline that is running. We asked uh, the system how many CPUs and GPUs are connected in a GB200 system. Uh, this data is quite recent, and LLM is not trained on this data. And without using a custom um, the data sheet that we have uploaded, um, it completely hallucinates and makes up something, some response, it says it's using Intel, Intel CPUs and also it's using V100 GPUs. Now with the same thing, um, if you use a knowledge database that we have um, ingested using RAG and issue a same query, now we see that um, it accurately say, says that GP200 is made up of 36 NVIDIA Gray CPUs and 72 NVIDIA Blackwell GPUs, and they're connected together using NVLink. So that's how easy to deploy um, rack pipelines uh, through, through a single interface. So what are the next things um, that we are exploring um, in terms of deploying inferencing services? Um, so one thing that, uh, that comes across is multi-node inference or distributed inference. Um, this is a use case where models are quite large and cannot be fit into a single GPU memory. So this is where uh, we have to use techniques called as a model sharding, um, where individual models uh, have to be sharded across different GPUs and also different uh, nodes um, in some cases. Um, I'll go through different shard sharding mechanisms um, in a second. Uh, but the, the key use cases of uh, multi-node inferencing is, again, to make sure that we were, we're able to deploy these massive GPU, massive models into a GPU cluster, and also to be able to manage them as a single entity. We, we should be able to auto-scale uh, them as a single entity and also load balance um, uh, easily across all these uh, inferencing services that are running. So we have two uh, popular uh, model sharding uh, techniques that are used. Um, one is called as a pipeline parallelism, where uh, a model is, is, uh, is split into different segments, uh, where each segment is consisting of different layers of the model, and each of the segment will be loaded into different GPU devices. On the left, I have three layers of the model loaded into GPU 0, and also the remaining three layers of the model are loaded into GPU 1. In this case, um, uh, computations are mostly sequential, so the computations have to be complete on, on segment zero, and once the computations are, are complete from segment zero, then they'll be fed into the next, uh, next segment in the pipeline. Um, internally, they use, for, for communication between these segments, they use Nickel, uh, for, um, which is a NVIDIA collective communications library, and they use commands like Nickel send, uh, Nickel receive uh, commands in this case. And other popular sharding um, technique is also called as tensor parallelism, where uh, computations within a layer is sharded across two different uh, multiple or two or multiple GPUs. For this example, I'm taking tensor parallelism as two, uh, where each layer is uh, sharded across two GPUs. For example, if there is a complex uh, dense matrix multiplication computation, uh, it is going to break break up the multiplication uh, computation into a smaller computations. And each of those smaller computations are shared across two different uh, GPUs within the same layer. 
And once the computation, the smaller computation is complete, it uses nickel um, all reduce uh, reduce scatter commands uh, to again combine uh, the result of the computation and send it to the next layer. The communication between the layers is again sequential. There is a dependent sequential dependency between the layers, but the smaller subtasks or smaller computations between each layer is done in parallel. So for multi-node multi uh, inferencing, we use both of these techniques to kind of partition uh, model and also make sure that they can fit into the GPUs that you have in the cluster. So what, what are the key challenges um, when, when using multi-node or distributed inferencing? So one thing is all of these uh, have to be scheduled as a, as a single entity, because even if some parts cannot run, um, we cannot service inferencing requests. So all of these have to be scheduled as a gang. And, and also, we need to have efficient bin packing uh, um, to be done in the cluster. We need to make sure all the GPUs are efficiently used um, and, and make sure that the, the inferencing, um, all, the, all the parts of the inferencing service are able to run. And from operations perspective, uh, we should be able to auto scale as if like a single entity. All of the replicas um, uh, of, of this particular multi-distributed uh, instance have to be um, auto-scaled across um, different set of nodes. And um, because we have sharded across different GPUs, the communication, uh, the message passing is important across all these GPUs. And for NVIDIA, we use MPI. There is also Ray, which is used for cross-GPU um, uh, cross communication. Um, um, but we, uh, we use MPI. Um, and also for auto scaling, uh, we need leader aware. Um, uh, sorry, for load balancing, we need leader aware load balancing. Because, um, and for optimizations, um, one of the key optimizations that we um, that we need for multi node in, multi multi node inferencing is to make sure that whenever we auto scale, whenever these new instances are coming up um, in, in 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 different nodes the models are readily available on those nodes. Because if the models are not available, it's going to dynamically pull those models on each of these nodes. And that will take uh, quite a bit of time. So we recommend using some sort of shared storage, like Minakshi was saying. We can use NFS, Ceph, um, any kind of distributed storage, NVMesh, uh, where uh, the volume can be easily uh, attached to different instances. And then model caching, the models are readily available across all these nodes. And also, for high throughput, we need to have um, uh, connectivity between all these nodes, um, like InfiniBand, Rocky. So configuration of this is very important across nodes uh, for multi-node inferencing. Lastly, uh, I'll talk briefly about AI agents. Um, so AI agents are becoming quite popular for advanced problem solving. Um, they are the next, next wave of generative AI. Um, what AI agents uh, basically do is they take the complex problem and apply reasoning and break the, the complex problem into smaller tasks. And when they break them into smaller tasks, they take advantage of external tools uh, to solve those independent tasks. Uh, it can be a weather application. It can be a web search. Um, so it will reach out to all these external tools to provide meaningful um, responses to the user. There's also a short-term memory and long-term memory where it can generate responses which are personal to the user and which are very con contextual uh, for, the, for the query. In terms of AI agents, the challenges we have is, again, in terms of standard. There is no standard as such to deploy AI agents into Kubernetes cluster. NVIDIA have agentic blueprints. Um, we have multi-turn drag agentic blueprints and virtual screening um, blueprints that have been published. Um, but we are looking to standardize the deployment of uh, blueprints or AI agent or pipelines uh, for AI agents. With that, um, I'll conclude uh, by saying that Kubernetes is a great, great platform for AI pipelines. Uh, we have very strong uh, GPU and storage integrations in Kubernetes. Uh, now with the DRA, we can do a lot of advanced GPU scheduling um, uh, in Kubernetes. That We are looking forward to integrate those kind of changes into, into the NIM operator. Um, and from storage side, we also have like well-established CSI drivers in place uh, where we can do all sorts of model caching. Um, connect different uh, kind of storage backends um, into, into the nodes. And also, we have advanced inferencing and uh, fine tuning uh, platforms. We have Kubeflow, we have KServe for advanced use cases um, that, are, that are quite easy to use. Um, 
and 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 communities working on addressing some gaps so we are kind of closely monitoring those um, in terms of providing auto scaling what kind of metrics to use uh, for auto scaling um, and also model cache management which like can we use OCI artifacts can we um, pull them into like S3 storage or NFS PVC so so we are also closely watching those things and finally LLM gateway um, is also becoming quite popular so we're also looking to see how we can integrate this with uh, with the service that we have with that um, I'll conclude the talk thank you and and yeah please provide the feedback and I'll take any questions <laughs>